And could you please keep your question comments very simple, very direct? So, yes? Yes, Evan. Um, I have two questions. I'll keep it very short. One, if I have this for you and um, the presenter from um, U, U, UNEP Resource Center, if I have a good project like um, landfill gas capture or large scale um, commercial biodigesters generating almost three megawatts of electricity, are there, good, are there developers that are willing to pre fund this um, project so that when the CR certificate is issued, then there could be an agreement to pay back? Does such facility exist? That's number one. Number two, considering the amount of time and cost being invested in project development, and um, I want to know if um, there is a procedure in place by UNF um, C to reduce this amount of time and documentation. For instance, most of the time when this um, um, CR certificate is issued, almost 30 or 40 percent of this money go back to these consultants that prepare and develop this project. And to me, from the south, I see this as capital flight. I don't really see if the CDM is achieving its objective. And then the process of going through this documentation is extensive and the monitoring process. Are there processes in place for UNF C to reduce this um, timing and then um, this cost involved in developing this project? Mm, OK, thanks. Third question, yeah. Thank you very much. My, my question is just one. I, I'm interested in finding out how the CDM ensure that uh, how, how does the CDM benefit the local populations whose rights are often at stake? Does it ensure that in its design? Because you know, from my own Buddhist understanding of the design of CDM, I I, I find a, a gap in it, gap in terms of uh, respect for the rights of uh, you know, local populations who uh, who are actually the host of some of these projects. So, uh, uh, and I look at the CDM design, I don't see this there. If somebody was talking about gender uh, sensitivity all the time. I, I think the whole CDM needs to be overhauled, overhauled to ensure that it's consistent with human rights. Because talking about indigenous people, for instance, you know, a lot of things happen on their land uh, in the name of reforestation and afforestation. Somebody take the benefits out of it, nothing comes to the indigenous people. So we wonder who exactly is meant to benefit <coughs> from this process? Who, is it just an elitist mechanism, or is it a mechanism intended to translate into welfare of people who are actually you know, bearing the brunt of climate change? Thank you. OK, thanks. OK, last two. All right, well, first two. My question is uh, Bulgan Murun, particularly you focus about uh, structural dimension of women's uh, participation in uh, CDM project. So um, on another side, have you any experience about the uh, process side, like uh, uh, participation of women gender, uh, participation of women in decision-making process and fund management and mo mobilization process, benefit-sharing process? This is my question. OK, last one goes to this gentleman. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. My question is um, very direct, just to build from what he earlier said. How do you incorporate the issue of inclusiveness and property rights into the CDM? Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so I, I suppose uh, question one. Uh, question one is mainly for Solon, and uh, question two is mainly for uh, Grant. Uh, the third and fourth question are mainly for Bergen, and the last question um, are for three speakers. So, who would you like to start? Solon? Oh. Paul? <laughs> if, if I take number one, then I will. The short answer, no. There isn't any one who would be willing to pay you up front for your credits. Um, as, a, as a prepayment for, for your expected production of CERs. It, 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 it has practically never been. It was in the very beginning of the market and the World Bank got, uh, burned its fingers on, on, uh, on that. Um, yeah? 
children. But but otherwise, very very few cases. Uh, I have I have tried with the Danish government in China to do uh, prepayment. We actually did manage to do one, um, based on uh, a sovereign guarantee that we were that we were presented with. Uh, but otherwise, it, it practically doesn't doesn't happen in the market. What what we have done with um, the loan scheme is is going part of the way. Uh, meaning that what we are going to finance or the loan scheme finances those costs for consultants um, that normally is borne by uh, the ERPA counterparts, meaning the buyers of the credits. The normal, the normal trade-off between a seller and a buyer is that if you sell your credits on a contract uh, to a buyer, he would then, the buyer would then assume the costs of, of development. Um, but not pay you upfront for the credits. Uh, with the loan scheme, we take over that responsibility, or the, or the project proponent can borrow the, lo the, the, the money against uh, the cost of, of, um, of the consultants, which allows them to avoid entering into a contract at a time where the credit would be at its lowest value. Because the, the primary CERs would be traded if, if the secondary CERs that was traded on, on the EU ETS now is trading at 1.87 euro, last I looked, uh, the primary CER would have to be somewhere below that amount. Um, if you if you wait and and issue your your credits unilaterally, meaning that you do not have a, a, an upper partner at the early stages, you would be able to cash in on the difference between the primary and the secondary uh, price. The experience from the loan scheme, unfortunately, is, and that is one of the main reasons why we have rejected at least some of the projects, simply uh, the cost of consultants are higher than the value of the credits. And that is just a fact of life. Uh, this is mainly, the, the, the benefit mainly goes to the consultants in the, in the current market, maybe even in the, in the formal market also. Which is why it doesn't really matter so much, as I said before. It doesn't really matter so much that these credits are not sold because those that are suffering the most are the consultants, not the project owners. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, just to recap the question again: How does it, how does the CDM benefit local populations? I believe. Um, is it consistent with human rights? Uh, is it inclusive? Does it include property rights, etc.? Um, I think we need to remember that the CDM is not a fix-all for everything. That's the first thing I think we need to remember. And that the rules as it's currently set up uh, dictate that uh, it is the authority of the host party to determine uh, these sustainable development criteria and if these, uh, along with national priorities, of course. So if, if it is a national priority to reduce poverty, to ensure human rights, our uh, code, codexes are respected, etc. Um, the expectation is currently under the current rules that the project would be approved by that national authority um, un under that guise, so those issues would be addressed. It's not necessarily the, uh, the responsibility of the CDM nor its regulatory body, the CDM Executive Board, to control that. It has no means to control that at the moment. Parties did not give the CDM board, executive board rights to go and quality check or verify any sustainable development uh, contribution at all. So whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, that's, that's to be discussed, of course. However, the board, the executive board has moved forward over the years, and we've seen this, uh, in wanting to be able to improve the way in which these things are, these development issues, these co-benefits, as I like to call it, local population issues, etc., human rights. The declaration of this, the expression of this in the project design documents needs to be improved. And so it's moving forward in, in trying to do that uh, with uh, a more structured way of declaring it so that it becomes more apparent what's happening on the ground uh, to everybody because these documents and this information is publicly available so anybody can criticize it. So that's a good thing in a sense because it's really an instrument that's exposing possibly issues uh, which uh, watchdogs or NGOs or anybody on the ground can question. 
There is, of course, also a local stakeholder process which is involved in uh, verifying uh, the claims made in the projects, and uh, that's also an avenue and a venue by which uh, projects, project uh, affected people, can voice their uh, their concerns. Um, the the question of whether this is uh, whether the the modalities and procedures or the rules of the CDM should change uh, has been posed many times, and um, in the negotiations at the moment, certainly the issues with regards to to, to uh, human rights, in particular, given some perceived or possibly abuses of those aspects under the CDM, are being addressed and are coming out in texts in the process of negotiation at the moment. And we we would hope also, I think, that in the design of the new mechanisms, there'd be a lot more um, um, very solid texts which would uh, embed a control mechanism or at least a a firm declaration mechanism to to make this more public. So I, it's a long-winded answer, but I think your answer is my answer is basically no. Currently not, simply because it doesn't fall <coughs> into the rule set at the moment. But we hope that it would. So the third question uh, was on uh, participation of women in decision making in relation to the CDM, right? So uh, I can, uh, during my research, I also observed non-CDM projects, which are similar energy environmental projects, but also very successful. So maybe I can take example of those projects. Uh, so before or during the project, uh, there is a stakeholder consultation meeting, which also plays a very important role in uh, involving whether we have to make this project, we have to implement. So I think here in the women's case, uh, because of their, their role that they play in their family, it's very sometimes the location of the project, for example, the stakeholder meeting, when it's somewhere very uh, far from their location, then women are not so much enthusiastic to participate because they rather stay and cook or take care of the babies because of the location they have to go. So this kind of, uh, I can say, the creating and the facilitating the uh, environment which gives functional uh, support to women was also good support. So I look at that this uh, base example of uh, maybe you have heard the Barefoot College in India. Uh, the uh, the person who uh, had created actually chose especially remote area of women, but all the grandmothers to bring them, even they are illiterate and doesn't speak any language. They just brought them and then created the facility so that they can also play their motherhood role and also they eventually they become engineers of solar energy and then they were the ones to provide the local empowerment in the um, bringing the energy in the local so that was quite inspiring for me so that's i can say that the participation that could make in decision making thank you and third question i i, I couldn't really Okay, thank you very much. I think it's time to close this section. And I would like to say thank you to three speakers for a very informative, very uh, thought provoking speech. And I also I would like to say thank you for the audience, for your attention, for your very helpful discussion questions. And I hope you all a very productive time in the next few days. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.